Well, good afternoon, everybody. We have a very unique opportunity to talk about a topic in the community today with two experts uh, who've really just done amazing work in Kenton County, and I'd like to introduce them quickly. So first of all, we have uh, Rob Sanders, who's our Commonwealth Attorney, Kenton County Commonwealth Attorney, and Alicia Webb Edgington, who is the President and CEO of the Life Learning Center. And uh, the, the work that you all do on every given day, even pre-COVID, is, is fantastic. But especially in this world we've lived in in the past number of months, you've just done an outstanding job in one huge area, and that is uh, managing the uh, jail population and helping to work with our judges to uh, keep the community both safe and, and also manage uh, potential risk. So there's a, it's a big topic, but first of all, I'll, I'll maybe jump to you, Rob, and maybe you can update us on really the efforts you've been working on since uh, COVID uh, hit our uh, community. Well, thanks, Judge. Um, we started out uh, before COVID really hit with over 748 defendants um, or inmates in our county jail. Many of those were pretrial defund defendants. Some of those were state inmates. There's been a lot of debate lately over how much of an effect COVID has on the average person that's out and about in the community. But one thing that has not been up for debate is that COVID has definitely hit hard captive populations, people that don't have the opportunity to social distance, that have limited ability uh, to cleanse surfaces and wash hands and things like that. And where we really see that most is in confined populations like nursing homes and uh, people that are incarcerated, whether it be jails or prisons. So here at the Kenton County Detention Center, when we were I think well over capacity. I think this jail is up until recently has been over capacity ever since we built it. So we made a very concerted effort between myself, uh, the detention center, the public defender's office, and all of our judges here in Kenton County that we were going to do what we needed to do to safely reduce the risk of a COVID spread at the jail. And to do that, we enlisted the help of Alicia Webb Edgington, the Life Learning Center, we started reviewing spreadsheets of all of our inmates, why they were there, what their charges were, what their bonds were. Um, what we found is we had a lot of low level nonviolent offenders, um, most of which who either had charges from other jurisdictions that were holding them here, we couldn't release them because they had warrants or holders from other jurisdictions, or else they were people that had not shown up for court before. So they, you know, when you don't get when you don't show up for court, the judges put warrants out for your arrest. They typically have higher bonds than the first time you were brought in. Uh, oftentimes, people don't make those bonds. They end up sitting in jail waiting for the outcome of the trial. We also had lots serving state sentences that we had given chances at probation in the past that we ended up granting shock probation to and giving them another chance at probation. As a result, we ended up reducing our jail population by about 55%. And that's just dramatic. Um, it's hard to put into words how dramatic of a change in the jail population that was. It allowed the detention center to close one dorm in the detention center for the first time since the jail opened. Uh, that allowed for sterilization of one dorm at a time and they would rotate the jail population, um, clean one dorm, fill it back up full of inmates while they clean the dorm they came from, then they would move inmates into the new clean dorm and so on. And they just kept that rotation going now for about the last three months. Um, as a result, we didn't get a single case of coronavirus in our detention center. And if you watch the news, you would know that we had outbreaks in prisons, both here in Kentucky and Ohio had one of the biggest outbreaks in the entire nation was at one of their federal prisons. Um, we did this, however, very carefully in a very concerted effort with lots of review of who these inmates were, where they were going to go, what supervision was going to be available. And one of the problems we have is that when you put somebody out that's been state sentenced, they can be supervised by probation and parole. But when you put somebody out on the street who is still awaiting a trial, there's very little options for supervision. And that's where the Life Learning Center came into. We uh, we made it a condition of everybody's bond that they report to the Life Learning Center and enroll in both substance abuse treatment and in their foundations program, which is ongoing job skills, employment, GED, things like that, which I'm sure Alicia should tell you more about. But we sent all of those folks that were pretrial defendants up to the Life Learning Center, and the Life Learning Center has been a great partner and really allowed us to safely reduce our jail population in order to keep the coronavirus out. And this relationship has obviously started, as you alluded to before, uh, COVID uh, came about. Uh, but Alicia, um, you know, this privately funded 
um, organization called Life Learning Center. It does a lot of things that <laughs> Rob referred to, but maybe you could just do a, a real quick recap of what it's all about. What's the mission and the organization that you run? Certainly, and thanks, Chris, and thanks to Rob uh, for the opportunity. But Life Learning Center uh, is a nonprofit here in Covington, Kentucky, and we provide a education and care continuum that are a holistic approach to addressing the at-risk individual in the community. So we serve across the board individuals, whether they suffer substance use disorder or conviction. It's individuals that have had challenges in life that need essential skills so that they can change, transform themselves, sustain themselves, regain their dignity, and then uh, contribute in turn back to the community. So the reducing the jail population and the applause goes to obviously uh, Rob's staff and Rob and the individuals on the bench. And of course, Judge Knockelman, uh, we can't say enough without the help of you and Terry Carl to help us uh, do this very collaborative approach. I mean, we, we could not do this without the support of all of those individuals that are in that equation. And uh, we saw a 207% 207 growth uh, during the release, but it was the efforts of the community and our community partners. We have over 100 community and residential partners here at Life Learning Center. And while we maintained the guidance uh, delivered by the state, we were able to serve the individuals and continue to keep them stabilized during this outbreak, uh, get them to work, back contributing to society and uh, maintaining their sobriety and working towards a better life. So you know, I think the, the point there, Rob, you made too, and, and Alicia, you guys have been supporting this and evolving your program over years. But, you know, the fact is the population of the jail, um, it was just un unbelie unbelievably high. So we were on knocking on 900, I think, uh, prior to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And now, we, you know, to your point, 55% lower uh, below 400. Now, I think there's maybe a takeaway from this as you develop this uh, relationship is you're evaluating this to try and manage this all while keeping violent people, of course, behind bars and making sure those who need to be locked up. Uh, but maybe speak to that a bit in terms of that, that relationship now, how that's evolved with the judges and, and, uh, and maybe some takeaways that you've got uh, that otherwise you wouldn't have had to deal with. Well, I wish I could say it was 100% successful. We have had people that weren't compliant with the, the program, whether it wasn't compliant with drug treatment or wasn't compliant with showing up at the Life Learning Center, but the vast majority have. Uh, I think this is, you know, it's been a group effort. The judges have been very conscientious about how many defendants that they kept in jail, how many defendants they were sending to the Life Learning Center, who is uh, continuing to participate and improve themselves stick with the drug treatment, stick with the counseling, and it leads them to a much more, um, I guess, informed picture of who they can trust to be back out on the street with another chance. And I think ultimately this will teach us a lot of lessons about how we can improve our criminal justice system, both how, who we can trust with probation or maybe a second chance at probation, um, what improvements we need to make to court notifications and making sure defendants are aware of their court date, um, improving the technology that we communicate with defendants with, make sure that their attorneys know where to find them. And if they change their address or their phone number, they can still get a hold of them. There's lots of improvements to be made, but very importantly, everybody in Kenton County should know the the killers, the rapists, the robbers, the child molesters, those aren't the people we're talking about. We didn't let a single one of those violent offenders out on jail are out of jail pending trial, they're all still in jail. So the number of people we've actually released is far greater than 55%, but we've had a 55% reduction in population because we have kept those violent offenders in, in order to obviously keep Kenton County safe, which is our number one priority. That's a great point. You know, and I think that's, you, you speak to this issue, uh, Alicia, is the, the, those who are being compliant, they're showing up to your facility and then you're helping to connect them to other levels of service as well. Uh, maybe you speak to that as well. I know you talk about the elected officials, but maybe some of the agencies that you're getting people connected to for other additional treatment, et cetera. Well, certainly judge and uh, paramount to that is uh, St. Elizabeth and Journey's recovery. Uh, 
the work that they do on the medically assisted treatment side, as well as our partnership with probation and parole, working hand in glove with them, sun behavior, transitions, be concerned uh, with, with our food pantry opportunities. I mean, I can just, as you can see, I can just continue to go on and on. Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission with their efforts on their light, heat, and power program. Um, I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. But one of the things that I, too, want to echo what Rob just said, for the community, for them to truly understand, we have authored a program here in Kenton County. There's none like it in the Commonwealth. It's a multidisciplinary team uh, that we are testing right now to see exactly how it all works. It's a multidisciplinary team that's comprised of a number of people in the criminal justice system to include both treatment uh, providers as well as probation and parole, uh, Terry Carl, Kenton County Detention Center, members of Rob's staff, as well as individuals from the Public Defender's Office that review every case weekly uh, here at Life Learning Center, we review their cases to see where they're at in their journey and identify potential gaps. And I will tell you, it's, it will revolutionize the way that we address um, these situations now and into the future, and not just specific to COVID, but specific to the census and the jails, how we're dealing with individuals in the court systems, um, and for nonprofits that provide services wrap around um, like we do. I, I truly think that we're really setting a precedent here. Well, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's unprecedented. I think that you have this kind of cooperation and Judge Summy referred to it the other day, uh, learnings that she's had on the justice side and the, and the, the uh, uh, from the judge's perspective. You know, Rob, you're working with them and then connecting them to services and all, by the way, most again, life learning being privately funded. You're not a governmental agency, so the community supports your efforts, Alicia. And then I think that goes to say, you know, it's one thing to reduce population for the jail. You have fixed costs, but obviously, the more the more, more individuals who are in that jail, the bigger the cost to the taxpayer. And if it gets to a point, we've had conversations when it got so high about, well, you have to build on this thing. Well, you delay the, the hopefully forever. The need for a bigger jail saves taxpayer dollars, and uh, you've done a great job to give us a heck of a lot longer time frame to have to do that. So I maybe you want to speak to that as well. Well, probably the biggest expense at the jail that goes up or down, depending on how many people are incarcerated at the jail, is the medical expenses. And especially when it comes to the coronavirus, folks need to keep in mind that everybody that is in the jail is on the taxpayer's dime when it comes to funding their medical care. And we don't get the same breaks that a lot of the insurance companies get when it comes to paying for those medical expenses. So if somebody comes down with the coronavirus and they end up in the hospital in intensive care on a ventilator, that's your tax dollars that's splitting that medical bill. So by keeping the coronavirus out of the jail, not only have we kept our daily costs for housing down, for meals, for things like that, but we've kept those medical bills all the way, or way down and we've kept the coronavirus medical bills totally out of the jail, which I think could have been millions, if not tens of millions of dollars if we'd have had an outbreak like they saw at some of the other prisons. Yeah, yeah it's an, an amazing point you make and I, I can't agree with you more. And Alicia, I know that uh, as, you're, as you're working with clients, are there any key takeaways that you see of these individuals as you try and get them back to becoming employed and you know, contributing to members of society and get past their challenges. Any, any kind of anecdotal stories you could share with us to open the door on some of these things we don't, we don't normally see? Well, you know, clearly, uh, Judge, it's, it's the opportunity for individuals to regain their ability to get a job and, and keep a job. You know, that's one of the, the things that you have to do here at Life Learning Center to graduate is you must be employed. And many of the individuals will tell you, they never thought they could, and you can just about fill in the blank. They'll say, I never thought I could get a job making this much an hour. I never thought I would have this many days sober. I never thought I would have an opportunity to get my children back. Um, you know, again, I wanna applaud the efforts of this collaboration because this is reducing tax the, the burden on taxpayers, but it's also getting people back to work. We're building a workforce with individuals that potentially 
haven't had, not potentially, I can tell you, statistics at our place shows, they haven't been employed in more than 18 months. So these are individuals we're getting back to work. So that speaks to our community partners and our workforce and their willingness to give second chance opportunities to individuals. Uh, and we're at the forefront of that here in Kenton County. I mean, it's unbelievable that we have over 150 companies here in Northern Kentucky that give second chance employment opportunities. So, I, I mean, that, that is the anecdote that we share with this and the collaboration efforts. And I will tell you, um, we, we are really making a move and this is a, a pause again to uh, Rob and his group, as well as the public defenders and to the bench that that the efforts that are being made for criminal justice reform are starting right here in, in Covington to show the efforts that, that we're making to keep people out of detention uh, and move them on a pathway to success. And hopefully it's gonna let everybody that, that has been through Alicia's program get a better outcome if they prove that they can do it. Unfortunately, some folks haven't taken advantage of this. They're gonna end up with a not so good outcome because we already see that they're, they're not playing by the rules while they're out. So the courts have been open now for about three weeks. We have been dragging folks back in by way of arrest warrant that weren't uh, compliant with the program. The folks that are being compliant and successful in Alicia's program, we are identifying those people as well and we're making sure that we reward them with a better outcome in their case. All the while, this lets my prosecutors focus on the worst of the worst defendants, the violent ones, the ones that need to be in prison for a long, long time, and that's where we wanna focus our efforts. Well, I think you both have wrapped it up in a very, uh, very, very perfect way that talks about the kind of things you guys are doing. So on behalf of the community, thanks a lot. You're doing amazing work and hopefully the results of this continue to improve and are, stay good. And as we get through this uh, pandemic and come out on the other side of it. So thank you both. And uh, of course, we're always here to support you in whatever you're doing. Great. Thanks, Judge. Thanks. Thank you.